Lord, we're grateful again, as we were saying, Lord, that we get to sing to you. We get to raise our voices. There are no mortar shells or missiles flying over our heads. And a lot of our world is just sitting on edge. They're not sure what's going to happen. And certainly the ones that are affected aren't sure where they're going to go. We pray, Lord, that you would let your light so shine in these dark countries right now, Lord, where all this is going on. We ask that you would protect our American lives that are out there, Lord. We ask that you would protect uh, your people, Lord, that are out there as well. And Lord, for us tonight, would you, Holy Spirit, teach us, Lord. Help us to hang on to your promises and let your people hear, Lord, your promises. Let them get back to even the book of Ezekiel, wherever they're at, Lord, and receive the promises that you have for them. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you may be seated this evening. So <clears throat> in our last time together, we considered uh, chapter 33, and we learned that we have a responsibility as a watch person. And we studied about the watchmen on the walls, on how it was their job to uh, be in the city walls. They were employed to kind of look out for the city. And so if they saw like or heard uh, the hoofs of horses, or they saw the dust clouds forming in the distance, it was their job to sound the trumpet, to let the people know, hey guys, we're going to be attacked. And we learned that if people listen and they protected themselves, well, it was a good thing. They preserved their life. But some people, like, uh, like many people even today, they won't take a word of caution. They speed up in the curves instead of slowing down. Right? They go through a stop sign instead of doing a full-time stop. So there are people who always kind of push the envelope. And so even at that time, if they weren't paying attention to the watchman, then sometimes they would die or be taken captive. On the opposite side of that, we learned that watchmen can be lazy. And so some of the watchmen, the Lord says, if you do not warn the people at all, then their blood is going to be on you. I would hold you responsible. So we took that. And we likened it to ourselves. We are the watchmen for our families. We are the watchmen for our friends. Some of the people that call us friends and they know we're Christians, hey, we should be sharing the things that we know about God that will benefit them, that will help them, that will help them at least be ready for whatever is coming down uh, around us. And so we are that watch person because it's not so much man or woman. Uh, it could be a single mom. It could be a, a family. We are called to be watchmen uh, for our families and certainly in our community, in our church. As Sunday school teachers, letting the kids know, young adults, letting the young adults know. And then we who are a little bit older, we should always be aware of what's going on in the world and our role in it as Christians and to certainly encourage others. So it was a great study. I loved it. Um, uh, New Testament says that prophecy for us it's not so much foretelling, but it's to edify, to exhort, and comfort. And so for us to exercise this gift of prophecy is something that we need to be doing, to exhorting one another, the watchman again, uh, to edify, build one another up. And, and it's hard sometimes because sometimes people say, all I get is a can of worms and it's hard for me. And my world is falling apart. Well, it is. And if you keep your eyes on the circumstances, it'll never get better. But if you start looking up, right? If you start asking Jesus for help, if you start getting back to where you were a, a while back, uh, we are built up in our faith again. And so that is edifying and helping us out. And we're called to do that. We're called to come alongside in comfort. You know, this uh, week, um, horrible news, one of our friends to the ministry, a sheriff, uh, Rick Mayer, passed away. It was sudden. No one expected. He was at work. And that afternoon, uh, uh, one of the officers called command, and they, they went out to where he was at, and, and uh, they had to administer um, first aid and everything else. But before he knew it, after everything was done, this man was gone, dead. And, and so <laughs> help us, Lord, that we take a situation like that in our jails, and we are able to help one another out to encourage the family. And so, yeah, Lord, use us to comfort. Use us to comfort one another when we go through tough times. We have some people that are ill right now. Some of them are looking for, towards some surgeries that are coming up. Help us, Lord, to come alongside and comfort the brothers and sisters that are going through that. So today, we move from chapter 33 and we consider chapter 34. And Ezekiel has a message from the Lord 
now to the leadership. Not so much the people right now. We've talked about the people, but he wants to talk to the shepherds. He wants to talk to the leadership of his people. And so that's where we're going to begin with verse 1. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? So let's consider this first couple of verses. As we begin this chapter, we have the Lord speaking to Ezekiel, as we see, regarding shepherds of Israel. That is, the leadership of God's people. So what is true yesterday for leaders, it's also something we can learn today. And again, I have shared with you, as Christians, it's not so much the pastor, though it is. It's not so much the, the Sunday school teachers, though it is. But it's also parents. You are leading your home. And so anything that we can pull out from the scriptures that helps us better parent, better grandparent, better uh, use our influence in that sphere that the Lord has given us, uh, we are to lift it from the scripture and apply it to ourselves. This is something that God wants us to, to do so that we can grow up, so that we can mature in him, right? And that we might be useful for him at one point or another, that we might be useful when people come to us for advice. So because God, because here, because God says Israel, right? He's saying to, uh, I'm talking about Israel, woe, woe to the shepherds of Israel. Understand that he's referring to all the Jewish people, right? Everyone that was in captivity, uh, Years before, Assyria had taken a group of people as well. And recently, Babylon had taken a group of people uh, to Babylon. So the southern kingdoms and the northern kingdoms. All of Israel. This is so something that God was speaking to their leadership, to their shepherds. Here in verse 2, we have a woe from the Lord against the shepherds. What is a woe? A woe is criticism. Whoa, buddy, what are you doing? Whoa there, sister, get back. You know, woe is a... Something to, that should catch your attention. And when it comes from the Lord, it's usually kind of like a little criticism, right? He is calling out the shepherds for being what? For being irresponsible. Woe to us if we are sliding and we're becoming irresponsible people. We are to be responsible people, especially in, in these last days, right? Their sin was that they were taking care of themselves, right? This is what he says. Hey, uh, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? So uh, it's, they were taking care of themselves rather than taking care of God's people. Kind of like today. What is one of the biggest things we see everywhere? Uh, we see moms or dads. Uh, dads, perhaps, when the kid's playing soccer. Dad, I'm going to kick the goal. Dad, but dad's on the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we've got to close the deal or whatever, da, 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 da. We see moms at shopping at Walmart. Mommy, 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 hang on, I'll be right there. Well, yes, you know, da, da, da. Or we're like this. Tick, 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 tick. Well, the kids are, are starving for attention. You might say, well, my kids should know better. Mom needs mom time. I got to have some alone time. Dad has to do the deals and this and that. Yes, that's true. But somewhere in here, God wants us to find a balance. You cannot ignore children. You just cannot do that. You can talk to them. You can, everybody else, let's take a time out. Honey, listen, give me just two minutes. Daddy has to do this. And we get down to their level and we talk to them. And let's make the deals, but make sure you're uh, faithful to the deal that you made. We are to be responsible. The shepherds of Israel are feeding themselves. God's saying that you're taking the best and you're not worried about anybody else. That is an irresponsibility and therefore a sin of leadership. When we're just doing that, watching out for us, for our success, making sure that we're uh, are going to come out good and we don't care about nobody else or it's at the expense of the children, the expense of the office staff, the expense of those that are around us, it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing. And so the Lord called his people on it. So if he's calling them on it, for, again, if you're his people, we get that from the scripture and say, gosh, Lord, how can I apply this to my life? Well, one is, duh. Don't be irresponsible, right? Don't be so much about you having to be number one. So that's, that's what's coming out of the scripture right here. Um, again, their sin was that they were taking care of themselves rather than taking care of the people. 
for the shepherds back then, for God's leaders today, that was and is a sin. That's the woe. That's what he's calling them. So God's question, should not the shepherds feed the flock? It's rhetorical. You know that's rhetorical, meaning it's more of a statement. The answer is yes. The shepherd is supposed to feed the flock, not disregard them. So we can put things on hold. That's not disregarding them. That's putting them on hold. But if that is your habit and it becomes more and more, then we kind of cross that line and we're really disregarding them. And, you know, we, got, we need to call a spade a spade. If that's what you're playing in your hand, you know, the Lord's saying, hey, dude, you know, you can't go there. You should not go there. Church, just to be clear, and for the benefit of those new to Bible study, perhaps on radio <coughs> or you're catching our, our broadcast, just to be clear, when the Lord spoke about the flock, because some guys, I, when I was a kid, I was this kid, I, I read or I, we would sing this song, um, something about, and the train of the Lord filled his temple. How many of you guys remember that song? I see the Lord, you know, and his train filled the temple. I was always thinking there was really trains going around. I said, man, he's so good. He's into all these old railroads and things like that, and they filled the temple and stuff. Sometimes we don't get it. And if there's not someone there to help us, uh, it just goes pew, past our head. And, of course, we as adults, I'm not going to ask, you know, well, Spencer, Spencer, what does it mean, the train? I didn't know it was his robe, you know, and we're just too embarrassed to ask those questions. So sometimes I want to um, not um, demean you. Please don't take it that way. But I want to make sure nobody misses it, especially radio and those guys watching on our tube. So when the Lord spoke about the flock, right, he was referring to the nation of Israel. Verse 2, it says he's speaking about the flock. So he's referring to the nation of, and, and that means people, not just a bunch of sheep, the flock, right? In fact, Psalms 100.3 says this, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So understand that the Lord refers to us as His sheep. And this is a great question because a lot of people say, Well, I don't know why I'm here. You don't know why you're here? You're to be following the Lord. You have been created for him. We belong as if you belong to a team. Some people belong to the Broncos, some to the Steelers, some to whoever. We belong. You and I are on the Lord's team. We belong to him. So if we belong to him, then we should be smiling and, and thinking, oh, my gosh, the creator of the world has allowed me to be part of his team. Hallelujah. And pom-poms should go up, right, or something like that. We should be ecstatic that he has chosen us. What does the Bible say? You did not choose me. I chose you. <laughs> For the kid on the playground that never got picked, but you became a Christian, understand that out of the billions of people in the world that don't know the Lord, God chose you to be on his team. This is huge. This is huge. We're going to have an inheritance we become, as we follow in Scripture, joint heirs with Christ when God gives him everything. It's going to be an amazing time for us. So it's a, it's a great thing for us. We should know this, right? So Jesus spoke of, lost, of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Another example, right? So flock, sheep as people, Matthew 10, 6. Jesus said, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So again, to the lost people. Now, don't be chasing sheep going this way or that way, real sheep, right? And we have them here in Colorado. This is amazing. I, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles, never had sheep. I told you, farm day was a big truck coming in. This is a cow, kids, and those second graders, wow, moo. You know, we didn't know. When I came here to Colorado, I was coming down on Minokan Hill or Minokan Pass, however you want to call it. <laughs> we were coming down the hill, and I'm seeing state patrol, lights, everything. I said, oh, my gosh, Judy, something happened. And we're living in Delta, and it's like the first or second week where, that we're here. No, it must have been a month after, and, and there was no snow on the ground. And we're coming down to the Walmart because everybody was going to come to Walmart. There was no Walmart in Delta. So we're coming down the Noken Hill, coming uh, south, and there's highway patrol and this and that. And we're saying, what in the world happened? You know what happened? They were moving a flock of sheep across the highway. We've never seen anything like that before. We're taking pictures. I mean, I'm sure the police obviously get back in the car, sir, you know, whatever. But we're taking pictures. We've never seen anything like this. First time we went up to Crested Butte, 
we were, or, 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 or I think Crested Bear or Rifle or somewhere we were going, we got stuck in this middle of a herd of cows. And there was real cowboys riding horses. And I remember on one time, Judy was, uh, I think she was looking for a place to have an event, uh, like we're having this weekend for the women's retreat. And uh, the, the uh, horsewoman comes up to her, ma'am, you got to keep going. And she goes, but there's cows. She goes, you can't, we can't stop traffic. Just go, the cows will move. And sure enough, she goes from three miles an hour to maybe seven or eight, and the cows are looking back at her, moo, moo, and it's like the ocean started splitting, but we didn't know these kind of things. So, so I say that to say this, sometimes we don't get it when the Lord starts talking about, you are part of my flock. And we just start thinking, gosh, is he calling me a sheep or a donkey or what? No, the Lord refers to people as, and his people as part of his sheep. And when you see the baby lambs out here in Ogden every once in a while by Walmart, when you see these little baby calves being born in the middle of winter, don't you just want to pick them up and hug them? That's the view of our shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to warm us up and give us his affection. So understand when he talks about his flock and he's jealous for his flock, he sees us as something precious for him. And so, yeah, I thought I'd just let you know that. In the New Testament, Jesus called himself the good shepherd, right? And he called himself the door of the sheep in John chapter 10, verse 7, and also verse 11. And so the image of the flock continued over from the Old Testament, Ezekiel, where we're reading, and, and before that, into the New Testament. So don't let someone tell you, well, oh, that was only for the Old Testament. Today we're the saints or whatever. We're still part of his flock. And that's why I say that. And it's interesting that, uh, here's a fact for you. The English word pastor comes from the Latin it comes from the Latin and it means shepherd. That's where pastors come from, right? Shepherds. All right, Ezekiel continues speaking for the Lord. Verse three, look at your Bible. You eat the fat, talking to these shepherds that were neglecting the sheep, right? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Okay, so you're hearing it as real sheep, what they do with real sheep, right? But understand that he's looking at it as his leaders doing the same thing that we would do to an animal. They're doing it to fellow brothers and sisters. You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Verse 4, the weak you have, uh, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Verse 6, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. So again, church, we're talking about people. What a cruel shepherd to ignore the people around him in the church, right? We're talking about people, the Jews, God's people at this time. The leadership or the shepherds have become totally irresponsible, right? And therefore, they had sinned against God, and they had sinned against his people, that flock of people that were there, right? Therefore, God would judge them for their selfishness. If you're not doing something for others, and it's only about you, then you are being a selfish person, right? Certainly, they were caught up in their own concerns and were neglecting their service or services to others. Don't take on the position if you're not going to be a good boss. It might be a dollar more an hour, but if you're, you're the kind of person that, oh, I'm in here for the money and I don't care about you and you're going to do what I say, ah, raise your hand if you have had a bad boss before. Right? There are people that are just bad bosses. They should never be bosses. And it's not until management catches up or hears enough complaints that they realize, ah, we made a mistake. I don't know why I promoted my brother's son or my sister's nephew or something, right? And you, we find out why they were promoted. But it's horrible if you work for a bad boss. Um, you can learn, certainly, the things that not to do, but uh, it's a bad thing. But here, here it is, right? You're taking advantage of the people, the Jews. They're being selfish. There's an application for us, right? 
And that's this. Christ leaders must not pursue personal success at the expense of our brothers and sisters who are broken and scattered. We should never, as leaders, take advantage of people. I um, have heard pastors tell people uh, the, the, the husband lost his job and the pastor just saying, you still got to pay your tithes. You got to pay your tithes and trust God. Well, I want that 10% in the church. And the family just lost the main breadwinner for the house? That is ridiculous. We, as Christians, know we pay our tithes. We get to keep 90%. But every Christian goes through a setback. There's always going to be layoff. And God forbid there's legalism there that someone says, you have to do this. Well, what about everything else? You know, so again, let's put up that slide. We must not pursue personal success. That pastor is saying, I got to maintain my uh, standard of living at the expense of our brothers and sisters. We can't do that. We should never do that. And so, Lord, help us again to get the big picture of how much you love your sheep and you would rather them be healthy and healed. And, and, and you know, later on they'll, they'll do more because they're grateful to God. They're not paying you, the pastor. They're returning to the Lord because they're, they're it's just amazing. You'll hear this later on during the week. I probably shouldn't even say anything, but I'm going to tell you. There are some people that the Lord has really blessed. And I love to hear those reports. Years ago, uh, uh, Charles Stanley was thinking about uh, uh, expanding the ministry. He was going to do this and that. And he had a board meeting. They went away for three days, as a lot of Christians do, just to pray about it and make sure their thoughts were pure, their plans were, were, were good. And so um, Monday morning came, or Tuesday morning came, and he was in his office. And uh, uh, he was, you know, trying to catch up on stuff. And, and uh, secretary said, hey, hey, we got um, Joe Mo from Kokomo here. And, uh, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm real busy. Yeah, well, he's a truck driver. He's passing by. And uh, he just wanted to say hello. He hears you on the radio all the time. He's up and down the country. He's just ecstatic that no matter what state it is, there's always a, uh, a Charles Stanley program on. And uh, so he goes... Uh, Charles Stanley says, all right, Lord, and puts the stuff aside, comes out, hey, Joe Moe from Kokomo, come on in, talk, let's talk. And so they had a little high and a little greet and meet and whatnot, and the guy says, well, Pastor Stanley at the end, he says, uh, I just want to uh, bless you, you know, uh, what do you need for the Lord? And, and, uh, and I want to ask you this, what have you been praying for, right? And Charles Stanley is thinking, okay, is this a joke or what? And, he said, and the guy says, be sincere with me, what have you been praying for? And Charles Stanley said, well, I'll tell you, you know, uh, I've been praying, we've been praying as a board about our expansion and uh, great. What's it going to cost? He says, well, it's going to be a million dollars. The guy said, oh, I can take care of that. Went to his checkbook, pulled it out and wrote him a check for a million dollars. Isn't that amazing? See, you don't have to force sheep. You, what you want to do is build them up. So today in Montrose, Colorado at Colorado West Christian School, right, this person comes in doesn't have any students in the school, doesn't have, uh, uh, she's not a mom of kids in the school or whatever, and came up to the secretary and said, you know what, the Lord's put in my heart to bless you, you know, and I just want to bless you, and maybe a principal uh, leader is going by, and he comes and says hello, and says, I just want to bless you, writes a check, and, and gives it folded to the, uh, to the secretary there, Brandy, right? And uh, uh, after she went and whatnot, you know, most pastors were told that, oh, we're going to do this and that. And don't ever, you know, you don't, we don't count your chickens before they hatch. Amen? How many of you guys know that? You don't count the chickens before they hatch. So anyway, they walked away, and, and uh, when they opened the check, just the check to the school for $100,000 today. Isn't that just amazing? There are, you don't have to beat God's sheep. You don't have to be a leader that uh, puts all these expectations on the people. We're there to, to love them, to share with them, to have everybody focus on the Lord Jesus as much as we can, to grow up together, to be there for one another. God puts it in the hearts of his people to do whatever. So I love that about that. So again, uh, Christ leaders must not pursue personal success at the expense of our brothers and sisters, especially those who are broken and scattered. And the sheep of Israel at this time, during these times, they were broken. Remember, the leaders just ignored uh, the prophets. 
uh, all of them, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, when they were saying, guys, you're just doing these, these things against the Lord. God's going to punish us for this. They wouldn't pay attention as long as they were uh, being taken care of. So church, giving too much attention to our own agenda just might push God aside and abandon those who depend on us. We're leaders. You're the parent. You're whatever. You know, we don't want to push our agendas that before we know we're putting the Lord aside and we're thinking more about us. People depend on us. Your family, your kids depend on you, right? Be there for them. Help them out in anything you can. All right, back to the scripture, verse 7. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, right? A prey is, we'll talk about it. And my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. Church, the last words anyone wants to hear is, You're fired. You're fired, right? Uh, this is exactly what God is saying to those shepherds who failed their flocks, right? From God's viewpoint, they failed. Not only would they be removed, but like the man on the wall, like the watcher on the wall who did not warn the people that here comes an invading army, he became lazy. Yeah, he was held responsible for the people. So not only would they be removed right here, the shepherds, but they would be held responsible what happened to the people, right, that they were supposed to be looking out for. Verse 8 states that the scattered people became prey, and they became the hunted. That's what prey is. They're the hunted, and the beasts of the field, perhaps at this time, tigers and lions and bears, oh my, but that's what it was in those days, right? Uh, they ate them. They ate the people. Because a shepherd wasn't watching out for them. All because Israel shepherds failed to watch out for, for them, right? There has to be consequences, church. There has to be consequence with, with the Lord, and there is with God. So let's bring it to today. Today's shepherds, be it pastors, Sunday school teachers, you know, or a Christian parent, we must consider this judgment that was meted out at this time uh, to the shepherds back then because they ignored God's people. We must care for those that the Lord has entrusted to us, right? There isn't another option. If you're the parent, you had these children, you just can't ignore them and send them away or whatever like many of our English friends out there, well, you know, the kid's turning uh, 12, I'm going to send them to boarding school, see them in six years or 10 years or something like that. What in the world is that? Well, you don't understand my situation. Well, you're right. I don't. Maybe it's you and the Lord, and maybe he'll give you an okay for that. But in general, what we're talking about is we cannot ignore our children. They're our children. You know, we, we have to watch out for them. We have to do what we can do. I think I shared with you many, many years ago, back in the 80s, 81, uh, we, we were going to Greg Glory's church. It was Calvary Chapel Riverside at the time. And uh, I hated this pastor. I, I didn't like Pastor Greg. He was always talking about, you know, uh, we got to take care of our kids and this and that. And I, I knew that, right? Uh, and then he started talking about, you know, moms, you know, you got to, you know, understand if you have to work. But if you don't have to work, you know, raise those kids. God didn't give you kids so that you can drop them off at a babysitter all day long. Well, there's always special situations. That's just the way it is, especially for single moms. I mean, it's hard. I understand that. We weren't in that situation. We were in a situation where I was at that time maybe making 30000 Judy was making like 18000 a year. And so together, man, we were in the money in the early 80s. We were making money. And so Greg's telling my wife to stay home with the kids. I hated this pastor. I wanted to buy a sand rail. I wanted to go out to Glamis with all the other desert bums out there and do the things. I wanted to go out to the river, you know, get that speedboat and whatnot. 
Uh, and he's saying, you should stay home. And I'm saying, wow, I'm looking at you. We drive home. And you know, oh, honey, maybe we should, I should stay home and I should leave. What? You're going to quit a career? You know, are you sure? And finally we got to the point, like on his second or third Sunday in a row, that I finally, okay, Judy, let's just sit down and pencil that out. We owe this, we owe that, da-da-da-da-da. The paycheck goes here. Here's our income. Here's our outcome. We just can't do it. Honey, but he, Greg is saying we should take a step of faith. I lost. I wish I could tell you I took a step of faith. Brothers, sisters, hallelujah. I, I wish I could tell you that. I was upset. You know, but Judy, uh, we decided that would be best. So when Andrea came, our second girl, Judy never went back to work. And what she started doing is taking kids in, and we became the Kool-Aid mom and all this stuff in those days. And it was a good thing. Uh, and we were, she did everything to help us do this. But we cut out going to the movies once a week. We cut out going to... Stierenstein or all the old places that we used to go out and whatnot, the spaghetti factory, all these th restaurants in Southern California. We just stopped. It was horrible. Uh, but over time, oh my gosh, over time, all my kids are in ministry. All my kids are doing well. And I think about you know, their lives and with the Lord, yes, but in our, those years, how the Lord helped us make ends meet. Yeah, you have to budget. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, but he changed our priorities around, you know, and it became good. So as a parent, thank you, Lord, we were able to watch over our kids. As parents today, again, it's our responsibility to watch over those who God has given us. Same thing goes if you're an employer. You're an employer you know, you have your management team, you have first-line supervision, you take care of your leadership, yes, but you also have to make sure that there is a Christmas party for the employees, that uh, you do give them a turkey, you know, if you can. Everything can't be about profit. We have to be have a balance in our lives that we are generous with the people whom God has put ar around us, you know, and, and you always want to work for or find a place where there's, there's companies like that. And, and I hope you find one, and then I hope more so that you, if you, the Lord promotes you and you're that person, that you can certainly uh, do that. All right. So, it's been said, in, in fact, let me put it up here, true leadership, right? True leadership focuses on helping others, not just on self-success. And I think that's where we get in trouble. The shepherds of Israel, those uh, guys in charge, the kings, the prince, it was all about themselves and making themselves look better at the expense of the people, right? That's how it was back in the day. You know, for us today, we, you know, true leadership focuses on helping others. How can they get ahead? How can you help them? Judy had a great boss when she was working. She was finishing up her last year, and she was in the uh, engineering section, and uh, the boss, we'll never forget him, uh, older man, engineer type. And uh, Judy went to work for him. And when he found out Judy's situation, he said, look, Judy, uh, this work doesn't have to be done from 7.30 to 5 o'clock. It's, it's work that if you want to take on a couple of classes, you've got to get out of the way, then come back in at 4 o'clock and work till 7, you know. And he arranged for her hours to be such that she was able to graduate from college. She was doing this and doing that, but what a boss. And I don't even remember if this guy was a Christian or not, but put the slide up again. Uh, his, he focused on helping others. It wasn't just Judy. Judy was one of many uh, uh, entry-level employees that came into work that he cared for them. He wanted to see them succeed. And when you have a boss that wants to see you succeed, this is a good thing. And so leadership for the Lord, we need to do the same. We need to make avail available, we need to avail ourselves to the new Christian. You know, attend a little discipleship class with them. Um, perhaps pray with him once a week or her once a week. You know, make a phone call to them or do something. Bring them to the Bible studies if they can't get there. Uh, we need to do those kind of things to help them succeed in the Lord. And certainly as a shepherd back then, oh my goodness, there was, the people were hurting this way and that way. And these guys were taking... Uh, all the stuff for themselves and not worry about anybody else. And the Lord sees that heart. So we come to our next section where we see God, the true shepherd. 11, look at your Bible. For thus says the Lord God, indeed I myself 
will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. 13. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country. <coughs> I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed the rich pasture, and feed in the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. So church, consider that when mankind fails, when the shepherds fail, when today a pastor fails you or a Sunday school teacher fails you, or maybe you're a young teenager and your parent has failed you, right? Think about this, right? When our Pastors and shepherds fail us. God does not fail us. He doesn't fail us, right? So let's uh, take a look at this uh, uh, little chart that we put together for you tonight. So man's failures, from verse 11, they lose sight. But what God does when man fails, he searches and seeks them out. That's our God. You backslid? Guess who still cares? Your church might have gotten rid of you, written you off. You have no opportunity to serve again. So man might fail you. The pastors might fail you. But God will search and seek out these people who others have called them backsliders and don't give them another chance to come back and forget that the Lord is in the forgiveness business and bringing his sheep back. God loves it when a backslider comes home to him. But other people couldn't stand it. Oh, he did this. She did that. Did you know it doesn't matter to the Lord. When someone comes back and seeks the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, the Lord lifts them up. He forgives them. He washes them away. And all this time you've been out there, you'll hear a song. Someone will say something. You'll see a little snippet somewhere where you know, if you think about it, God is speaking to your heart. And so he does this. From verse 12, won't seek sheep uh, when weather is bad. And did you read that? Our God seeks and delivers his sheep even when scattered in bad weather. Usually uh, real uh, farmers and, and things like that or real ranchers and stuff, uh, the real ones that care for their stuff, you see them out there riding their horses, rain coming down. Their hats look like rain gutters as water's coming out. But I'll tell you what, these guys go after them. They don't like their stuff to get lost. I know a couple of guys that are, are there when the cattle are born at 2 or 3 in the morning in January and February, and it's freezing out there. But if that cattle doesn't, get, that baby calf doesn't get help, it's going to die out there. And so these guys are out there in the weirdest time of day, 24-7 sometimes, to make sure that the calf survives. These are people that are dedicated to their job. And so that's how the Lord is. He delivers us even when we're scattered in bad weather, if you may. From verse 13, uh, man's failures, well, they don't care who takes it, who takes them on or where they're taken. He doesn't care about you. Oh, he went with the Jehovah's Witness. Ah, oh, let him go. Oh, he went with the other church. Ah, oh, let him go. No, not our Lord. He cares who takes them. He brings them back home. He restores and he feeds them with his word. Right? That's our Lord. He'll kind of straighten out the things that, you know, sheep get in trouble. Calves get in trouble. You know, we get in trouble. We get in trouble. But how neat that we have a Lord that's willing to bring us back home. Next slide. So we get to uh, man's failures again from verse 14. They won't feed them or provide safely. This was the shepherds back then. They didn't care if the people were starving. It was all about them. They just didn't care, right? They didn't provide safety for them. So there comes the armies and take the people away. But how about our God who doesn't, who, who, what God does when man fails, he feeds them, he provides safety, he protects them, he keeps them together. I have them in the high mountains of Israel. I have done this and that. As you read those verses, this is who our Lord is. He really 
cares for each and every one of us. He does. And we're messed up. <laughs> but he cares for us. Oh, Ben, you messed up again. I know. Are you going to tell me that? No, I'm not. Just let's come on, come on. You know, and he takes care of us. That's our Lord. From verse 15, they don't or they doesn't nourish or give them rest. But God does. He nourishes them, his sheep. He gives them rest. I think that uh, knowing the Lord and, and looking back on these last, um, you know, umpteen years, God has given me times of rest, and he's, he's picked me up. And uh, there's nothing like him. He gives us these kind of breaks. He's, we have a, a, a very caring, loving, awesome God that does what nobody else would do. Lastly, right, it says, God will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Wow. Those have, that have, again, gotten rich off of others and never paid attention to them, the shepherds, the prince of Israel, who was all about the, they having uh, the best in the kingdom. Uh, you think about the, the Middle Ages, and you think about Sir Arthur's court and all his guys, right? And, and you think about the people. Most people were poor and uneducated. And, but uh, everybody in the castle, they ate well. They ate the best. God doesn't like that to happen to his people if you're in leadership. He wants us to uh, do the best we can, especially if he has charged us with responsibility over other human beings. And especially if you're a Christian, he wants us to be watching out for others. And so we thank the Lord for that. And he says he will judge those that don't do that for his people. So what we learn from these verses is that God promises to take charge as shepherd of his scattered sheep. He promises to do them. The good news for us today is that when our leaders fail, we too must not despair, but remember that our Lord is in control. If you're going through a bad situation right now, look up to your heavenly Father. He is sitting on the throne, and he cares for you. He says that to us. <coughs> he promises to return and care for us, his flocks, right? Therefore, when we are not being loved, you feel like you're not being cared for. I don't think they associate me with, with the rest of the thing. Listen, uh, turn to him for help. Turn to him for help. You know, he will comfort you and he will give you security. It's the Lord that we find those things in. As he was for Israel of old and Israel today, he is in control and can transform any tragic situation. Our Lord can. He can transform it. To produce good for his kingdom. That's our Lord. He can do it. Broken marriages. God can restore that marriage. If the people would turn to him and look to him, that couple, God will restore the marriage. If the people are still so angry they can't even pronounce G-O-D or talk about G-O-D, it's on them. They're angry and they're run, running around with their bitterness, but they're not turning to the Lord. They're pointing the finger at someone else, but they're not saying, hey, it's not the preacher, not the teacher, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Do you guys remember the old songs? Man, it's so true. You know, stop looking at your situation. You're not going to fix it. You probably helped get it there. But look up to the Lord. He can change that situation. And he's certainly the answer for our kids who are going and struggling through troubles or our families, right? 17. And as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture? Then you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture, or the remainder, and have drunk of the clear waters, that you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 20, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself would judge between the fat and the lean sheep. So church, bad shepherds back then, bad leaders today, are not only selfish, but they become destructive. They just become destructive, right? So don't muddy the waters for others by bringing out doubts, uh, teaching false ideas, 
and even acting like the world. There's some pastors you don't know if they're Christians or not. I don't get it, right? If you do, you will destroy your flock's spiritual nourishment. A little while ago, about five years ago, maybe less than that, uh, there were some pastors that were um, using even bad language from the pulpit. And when you ask them, what, what are you doing? They said they wanted to relate to the people. They wanted to relate to that generation. Don't go there, guys. <laughs> Don't muddy the waters. I was at a Calvary Chapel conference, one of our own, and uh, he was drinking water, and they gave him a water because he coughed a little bit, kind of like I do. But when he finished the water, you know, instead of putting it down, kind of nonchalantly quiet down, on his, he had two bottles of water in a 40-minute talk or something like that, and he'd finish the waters and just throw the bottles over his head. Second one, just threw it over his head, threw it in the back. And some people, well, that's cool, man. You don't put, you know, so what? He's doing God's thing. To me, I, I couldn't even listen to the guy anymore. It messed me up. I know, maybe I'm <laughs> turned a little bit too tight. I don't know. But uh, it just throws me off. So pastors, you know, know your, your congregation and, and be careful. And you moms and dads, know your children. Do not exasperate them. The Bible says, right? Be patient with them. Uh, we all have to be wise in those things. All right. 21. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad, therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. So, church, as there was bullying shepherds back in the day, there are bullying pastors today, right? God's going to judge them. I talked to you about the ones that they uh, have to have their ties or they're not happy with you. <coughs> God will judge these people. 23, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. 24, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, has spoken. Well, you know your history. King David has been out of the picture for years. He's dead and gone at this time by now. Therefore, this speaks of the son of David, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who will give his life for the sheep. John 10, verse 11. Here, God promised to send a perfect shepherd opposite of the bad shepherds, right, of yesterday and today. And, of course, the perfect shepherd, once again, is Jesus. As we look to the future in these remaining verses, it is Jesus who is going to set up the perfect kingdom. The peaceful kingdom. Only Jesus can do this. So we're going to jump ahead because this is what Ezekiel does. He says this, 25. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Well, church, do you remember just recently as we looked into the future? The book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 8. The pale horse that represented death. Part of the remaining population on the earth will be killed by the beast of the earth. That's coming. That's future. Ask your friends in Boulder why they're allowing wolves to be let out in our <laughs> ranches and things like that. Our world is turning for the worse every day that goes by. Here in verse 25, the good shepherd will cause these wild beasts uh, to cease. When Jesus comes back on the earth, he's going to take care of everything. He's going to change the world around. 26. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There, sh there shall be showers of blessings. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. Listen, agriculture in the land of Israel always depended on the early rains and the latter rains of the Lord. If the people behaved themselves and did what God had asked them, God would send these rains and the land would produce. But in Leviticus it tells us, if the people did bad and did not repent, the sky would become like bronze, if you may, right? And the ground would become as iron. 
But if they repented, God would forgive them and he would send the rain and heal the land once again. In the tribulation period, it is going to be a tough time for farmers to grow anything. Food is going to be really scared, scarce during that time. And they, shall, and they shall no longer be prey for the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. So today, today, if you turn on your news, Israel is becoming prey, P-R-E-Y, right, for the nations, right? Prey, again, as in an animal that is being hunted. Just a few days ago, there was a film that came out, a news report that came out, and it showed an airport in Russia. And there was this band of Jew haters busting in, going into the holding areas, looking for Jews so that they could kill them. This is going on right now. And it's becoming like the latest, um, the latest uh, fad in our world right now to become a Jew hater. It is, it is a wake-up call for us that the Lord says in the last days, watch what's going to happen, right? And so we know that God is going to certainly judge this world, and the Jews are right in the midst of them. And it's not until they start crying out to the Lord, right, that uh, the end comes. Many of them are going to be saved. He's going to seal 144,000. We know that. They're going to go through this tough time and whatnot, and they will walk into the, um, to the millennial kingdom. But until that millennial kingdom, right now we see these things happening, and for you and I, we should know that, man, you are about to come and take us out of here. You're giving us a little taste of what it's going to be as we turn on the news and they hate Israel and they, ah, and Palestinians. And then in America especially, right, we, I already told you what's going on in the colleges and the demonstrations and whatnot. A couple of days ago, there was a, a, here in America, I forget exactly where, there was this whole Palestinian people, uh, ah, for Palestine, free, blah, 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 them, and da, da, da. And across the street was this older man holding up a little Jewish flag. Never said anything, right? They came across the street, beat him, and the man died. This is like 72 hours ago that this just happened. What is the Lord showing us, right? He's showing us that these times right now that we're living, they're not going to go backwards. Things are not going to get better with your next president or election, right? Uh, it's not going to go well for America or for the world. God tells us he did not uh, bring his people for judgment. We're not going to be judged like that. We have accepted Christ. So therefore, he's going to take us out. But before he does that, you and I should be really alert, really trying to do our best with the Lord because these times are here right now and they're happening so fast. How fast has this, these things happened? They're going fast. We're going to be out of here fast as well. 29. Well, we're talking about hunting the Jews at the airport. But here in Ezekiel 34, 28, God promises to deliver them from these evil nations. The Jews are still going to be standing. Many are going to lose their lives, but it's going to be standing even at the end. 29, I will raise up for them a garden of renown. Wow. And they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. So upon Christ's return... Israel will be greener and more productive than we could have ever imagined that the Garden of Eden was. And we know how fruitful it was. God, upon his return, he's going to do this. It's going to be a garden of renown. It's going to be a great place, right? The Gentiles that come into the millennial kingdom are actually going to honor the Jews. And it says that these different countries, Gentile countries, are going to bring their treasures to Jesus when he is ruling in the millennial period, right? And the Jews will no longer be a hated people as they are today. Today, oh man, it's getting bad. bad. Verse 30, thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord. So church, grant it. It will take a lot. It's going to take a lot to turn the Jews to the Lord, for them to cry out, to God and call him their Lord. So I believe personally that these things that are happening around the world, right, the movement against the Jews 
is for the purpose of them to wake up spiritually and return to the Lord. So what we are seeing world, worldwide, it, it's starting to look and sound like Germany's final solution to the Jewish question, right? The final solution to the Jewish question that occurred between 1941 and 1945. It started off when the Nazis came to power in 1933. The Nazis were anti-Semitic. And this is what we are seeing a great increase throughout the world right now, all over the world. In fact, it seems to be the latest fad, as I said, to be anti-Semitic. Our last verse, 31. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. In this last section, we have learned that in the future, God will deliver and lift up his people. He's going to do that. And they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah and as their God. We know it today. Unfortunately, for the ones that don't, they're, getting, they're being prepped for the worst time in history. Worse than any other time in history is still coming up in the seven-year tribulation period that begins with the rapture of the church, with the removal of his people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this chapter in Ezekiel that both gave us the history of shepherds, lessons for us to learn, and the future for your people, Father. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now, for all of Israel, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort those who need the comforting right now, and Lord, we thank you for where you have us, so many thousands of miles removed and still, Lord, uh, being able to have our services and we don't know for how long. Lord, keep us ready to hear your trumpet sound that we are ready to go with you, Lord. Have mercy on those who stay, Lord. May they come to you during those times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.